High nitrates are not just a problem here in New Zealand, but they're a global issue. If you've got high nitrates in freshwater systems, that can lead to eutrophication, uh, excessive growth of algae, of slime. When that dies off, it basically strips the oxygen out and you get dead water. What we're doing uh, out at our Silver Stream research site is a proof of concept, so it's just a small length of wall, 25 metres long, and we're putting it across the groundwater flow path. What we've got to make sure with a alluvial gravel system, they are very fast flowing aquifers and particularly the permeable channels within those is where the most of the water and most of the nitrate is transported. We've measured the hydraulic conductivity of these things. They range from about 1500 to 15,000 meters per day, which is very high. So what we've had to do for the denitrifying waters to make sure that the wood chip and gravel mixture is even more permeable. So we've aimed for between 10,000 and 18,000 metres per day of hydraulic conductivity. Understanding and quantifying nitrate transport through fast-flowing alluvial gravel aquifers is uh, quite uh, difficult. The majority of the transport actually takes place within very small, very clean gravels that allow nitrate and uh, water to flow very, very fast. Intercepting and identifying these uh, fast flow parts is uh, quite uh, difficult, but for the uh, technology to be successful, we need to make sure that the wall actually intercepts these uh, high permeable channels, but at the same time, allows the nitrate to remain within the wall for sufficient time for all the biochemical reactions to occur. We are using data from uh, um, we obtained during uh, drilling, uh, data from uh, regular hydraulic testing and uh, water sampling, um, tracer testing and geophysical surveys. To actually be bringing all this uh, data together using very state-of-the-art uh, modeling inversion techniques is uh, quite fascinating. It's what allows us to understand the underlying biochemical processes that uh, are happening uh, within the wall, how the hydraulic behavior changes uh, with time, evaluate the ongoing performance of uh, the technology, and also improve our design for future applications. With the time-lapse geophysical data, we can look at flow pathways through the aquifer and the barrier. And from this, we can kind of infer something about the residence times of solutes as they move through the barrier. And this is really useful information for assessing the denitrification potential of the barriers. Once the PRB has been put in place and denitrification has been done, ESR has collected a lot of their samples, we can then go ahead and put a saline tracer upgrading of the PRB and watch how it interacts with the barrier itself. Optimistically, the saline tracer would approach the barrier, disperse through the barrier and travel out. It should still follow the preferential flow paths in and out, but if that changes, we'll see that using the 3D ERT and the models that come from that. We've been able to go from I suppose an hour and a half per capturing one 2D transect to seven minutes for an entire 3D array. From my perspective, a novel element has been the way in which we fuse together hydrological, hydrochemical and geophysical data to gain a coherent single model of how this system works. And when we have that model, we can improve designs of these kind of barriers, but also think about future designs of similar systems in other areas. Groundwater is a living entity, so it's got lots of biology that's present in that system. We tend to use genomic approaches because it's very difficult to see the organisms that are present in groundwater systems. So we combine that with also going and basically fishing for some of the larger organisms. So we're looking at the effects on the bigger organisms, so Saiga fauna. And we know that what happens there is because we're putting in a carbon source, which is a food source for a lot of the microbes, they then um, start growing and proliferating and we tend to get an increase initially in some of the bigger organisms, which is the protozoa. And then in terms of the Steiger fauna, so the big crustacean type species, we tend to initially get an increase because it's a bigger food source, but then they tend to move further down the system because the oxygen level drops as well and Steiger fauna are particularly susceptible to oxygen levels. So that's what we're finding at the moment. The wood chip denitrification wall has been in operation for three years. Uh, in the first year of operation it proved very effective. Within the first nine months when there was an export of labile organic carbon, the wood chip wall reduced effectively all of the nitrate going through it. The long-term effectiveness of the wall is the focus of ongoing study. However, in the three years of the wall's operation, we estimate it has treated 
13 times more water than previous wood chip denitrification wall trials. So effectively 39 years worth of treatment. But this provides a really practical demonstration that's been well researched so we can take it to our communities and say, here's something that can be done. But it's also important that multiple parties have been involved because we need to be able to demonstrate it's not just the scientific practicality of it, but that it works and people can understand it. So a multidisciplinary approach helps that. A multi-party approach helps the research to be focused on exactly what is required.